thank you all for coming. My name is Katie Collum, and I'm the program director for Maurer's chapter of the American Constitution Society. This event has been a collaborative effort by the Harmony Meyer Institute for Democracy and Equity in Education, ACS, the GLBT Alumni Association, and many other co-sponsoring organizations. And we'd like to thank all of those involved for their hard work and support in putting this together. We're extremely excited to have Roberta Kaplan here today and to have Maver's own Professor Steve Sanders here to introduce her. A graduate of the University of Michigan Law School, Professor Sanders clerked for the Honorable Judge Evans of the Seventh Circuit before joining the Supreme Court and Appellate Litigation Group at Mayor Brown, where he practiced for four years representing clients such as the ACLU and the American Association of University Professors. Professor Sanders has also taught at the University of Chicago Law School and Michigan Law before joining the Maurer faculty in 2013. A favorite among students, Professor Sanders teaches in the area of constitutional law and public law. His current scholarship focuses on issues facing the LGBT community at the intersection of constitutional law, federalism, and family law. You might also recognize, recognize him from publications on SCOTUS blog, The Atlantic, as well as a number of other mainstream media outlets. Whether he is teaching students, vindicating rights through litigation, or shaping legal thought through scholarship, it is easy to see why Professor Sanders is regarded not only as a brilliant legal mind, but also as an unwavering advocate who faces these issues with creativity and compassion. I have personally had the chance to learn from Professor Sanders in two classes and in projects outside the classroom, and it is my sincere pleasure to introduce Professor Steve Sanders. You. You, would think, um, you would think all of you came here to see me, which you didn't, but thank you, Katie. That was very kind. Um, Roberta Kaplan is a litigator at the top of her game, and that would be true even if it weren't for the historic victory she won less than two years ago at the Supreme Court. Robbie received her bachelor's degree from Harvard and her law degree from Columbia and held prestigious clerkships with a federal district court in the New York Court of Appeals. She's now a litigation partner with the firm of Paul Weiss in New York, um, and she's represented clients ranging from Citigroup and J.P. Morgan Chase to the Minnesota Vikings and Airbnb in complex, high-profile, and high-stakes legal matters. But of course, it was her representation of Edith Windsor, the irresistible, irrepressible octogenarian namesake of United States versus Windsor that secured Robbie's place in the front ranks of this nation's most visionary and distinguished civil rights lawyers, as well as as a role model for women, for out LGBT attorneys, and for all who work toward an expanded understanding of constitutional liberty and equality. Um, in one of the most insightful things I've ever heard from a legal commentator, SCOTUS blog publisher Tom Goldstein observed on the day that Windsor was decided that when reading a Supreme Court opinion, it's important not just to read the words, but to listen to the music. You realize how true that is when you recognize the warm empathy with which Justice Anthony Kennedy, in that opinion, speaks about Edie Windsor and her late partner, Thea Spire. When at first Windsor and Spire longed to marry, Justice Kennedy writes, neither New York nor any other state granted them that right. It seems fair to conclude that until recent years, many citizens had not even considered the possibility that two persons of the same sex might aspire to occupy the same status and dignity of that of a man and a woman in lawful marriage. For marriage between a man and a woman had been thought of by most people as essential to the very definition of that term. That belief for many who've long held it became more urgent and more cherished when challenged. For others, however, came the beginnings of a new perspective, a new insight, he continues. The limitation of lawful marriage to heterosexual couples, which for centuries had been deemed both necessary and fundamental, came to be seen as an unjust exclusion. Now, DOMA, as most of you know, didn't actually prevent couples from getting married, but it did prevent the federal government from recognizing those marriages. And the court said that was a denial of basic principles of equal protection and due process. The avowed purpose and practical effect of the law here, the court said, are to impose a disadvantage, a separate status, a stigma, upon all who enter into same-sex marriages. Harvard Law Professor Noah Feldman has written that one reason Windsor became the first and so far the only successful marriage equality case decided by the Supreme Court was that Roberta Kaplan's brief in that case put gay equality and dignity front and center. 
But the Windsor decision did far more than strike down a regrettable federal law. It also set off a truly extraordinary wave of lower court, uh, lower federal court decisions across the country, including in Indiana, striking down state bans on same-sex marriage. As justices recognized that Windsor's basic rationale that laws are constitutionally repugnant when their only purpose is to impose a disadvantage, a separate status, a stigma, that rationale applied to state law bans as well. Um, four of those state laws are now before the U.S. Supreme Court, um, and after Robbie and I were brought together on Facebook, never underestimate the power of social media, um, I have the privilege of serving as co-counsel with her and Professor Dale Carpenter of Minnesota on an amicus curiae brief in those cases on behalf of the Human Rights Campaign. Um, today's event is also being live streamed over the web, including to our friends at the McKinney School of Law in Indianapolis, and we will have a reception following this event, to which you're all invited, in the faculty lounge on the third floor. Um, the event is made possible by the generosity, foresight, and support of the American Constitution Society, Outlaw, the GLBT Alumni Association, the Maurer LGBT Alumni Advisory Board, the LGBT Project, the Black Law Students Association, Law Students for Reproductive Justice, the National Lawyers Guild, the Feminist Law Forum, the IU School of Education, and the Harmony School Deborah Meyer Institute for Democracy and Equity in Education here in Bloomington, which Robbie actually helped to inaugurate last evening. So thanks to them, you have the opportunity to hear from a lawyer who truly, and this is without hyperbole, uh, uh, who won a truly landmark case, which law students and scholars will be studying for generations to come. Uh, please welcome to Mauer, to IU, and to Bloomington, Roberta Kaplan. Thank you, Steve. Uh, you pretty much said everything that needs to be said about the Windsor case, so I can just sit down right now. Um, it, it's true, um, I guess I have friends, I shouldn't say, Facebook is a client, but I'm going to say it anyway. I have friends on Facebook, um, but that's not the same kind of friendship as we've actually made over the past, since, past few weeks since working on this brief, so I really appreciate that. Um, let me tell you at the beginning what I plan to do. Uh, kind of give you a roadmap, and then we'll do it, and then I'm going to obviously uh, save some time for questions uh, at the end. Um, what I like to do when I give this talk is kind of do the law geek version of ESPN Sports Night. Uh, and what I mean by that is I'm actually going to try to bring you into the Supreme Court courtroom uh, on the day of March 27, 2013, when I argued the Windsor case. Uh, as you guys probably know, you can't film inside the Supreme Court courthouse, courtroom, uh, someone tried it, I think it was last term, and they got hauled out in handcuffs. Um, but they do have audio clips. So we've taken those clips. We've taken kind of the key passages. Um, I'm going to talk about them, cr critique myself. You can feel free to critique me as well. Um, and that's, that's kind of the, the point of this talk. But before I get there, um, as Steve so brilliantly explained, I, I have to start with my client, Edie Windsor. Um, <clears throat> Edie Windsor, who's now 85, um, has truly become uh, an A-list celebrity. Um, she literally, she lives only a few blocks away from me in Manhattan, uh, but she literally cannot leave her apartment uh, without people asking her for autographs, for selfies, for photos. Um, uh, fortunately for Edie and for all those people, she loves it. Uh, she loves the attention, which is a good thing. Uh, but she has truly become uh, what I would call an A-list celebrity, at least in New York and I think in, in large parts of the country. Um, some of that obviously has to do with this wonderful article written by Ariel Levy in The New Yorker. Um, I'm not going to read the first sentence out loud. You can read it for yourselves. Uh, but it will give you a sense of Edie's personality. Um, uh, two years ago, uh, Edie was up for Time Magazine Person of the Year. Um, she didn't quite make it. Uh, she came in as runner-up to the Pope. Um, but she has told me that she's okay with that. She was perfectly fine with the decision. Um, and then moving from kind of A-list celebrity to D-list celebrity, um, if you had told me uh, when I was growing up in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, in the 80s, uh, that I would one day uh, be a litigation partner of Paul Weiss, who was an out lesbian, who was married to a woman, who had a child, um, and that I would argue this big case in the, in the United States Supreme Court, 
um, and that I would be on the pages of Cosmo magazine. <laughs> Um, I definitely would have told you that you needed to kind of cool it with the, with the pot and the drugs, whatever you were doing, because that was completely not going to happen. Um, so I think there's another uh, explanation, besides the fact that Edie is incredibly charismatic and actually pretty good looking, to, to say the least, and all those things. I think there's another reason uh, why she has become so significant. And I think a lot of it, um, as you heard Steve talk about, has to do with her own life. Um, and what happened in her life and how we tried to convey that really from the very beginning of the case uh, at the district court level, at the circuit court level, and then to the Supreme Court. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit about Edie's life and then we'll get it, we'll kind of flash forward to the Supreme Court. Um, Edie was born um, during the Depression in Philadelphia um, to a uh, Jewish family whose parents were immigrants. Um, her parents lost their home and their business during the Depression. They moved in with relatives. Um, she went to Temple University. She graduated uh, with a degree in psychology. Um, and then shortly upon graduating um, Temple University, and this is not something that's widely known, uh, she got married to a guy, a guy by the name of Windsor. That's how she gets the name Windsor. Um, she says at the time um, that it was inconceivable for her to actually live her life as a queer her language, and for that reason, she married this guy, Windsor, who was her brother's best friend, who had fought in World War II in the Army with her brother, and who she loved as a family friend. Uh, needless to say, uh, that marriage did not last very long. It lasted a matter of months, and after a matter of months, Edie said to her husband, look, uh, you deserve to be loved really the way you deserve to be loved, and I need something else. So she essentially came out to her husband. This was in the 50s. Um, and like many, many, many people, including me, a couple generations later, she decided to move to New York City in order to be gay. Um, it's a great story, obviously, a great story about Edie and her husband, but it's a great story legally, too. And, and let me try to explain. I, I'm sure there are law students in this room, and I'm sure some of you have taken constitutional law. Um, and I'm sure if you have, you're familiar with the factors that courts look at in deciding whether a group, a minority group of citizens should be, get what's called heightened scrutiny. In other words, should the courts look at laws that treat that group differently kind of on a more demanding level than they look at regular laws, like laws that treat optometrists different than ophthalmologists. Um, and those, those four factors are as follows. One, is there a history of discrimination against the group? Two, um, it, do you, um, uh, is there anything about being a member of the group that has anything to do with your ability to contribute to society? In other words, can a gay person be a great doctor, a lawyer, a dentist, computer software programmer, a judge? Three, uh, can you or should you have to change being a member of that group, and this is the key factor for this, in order not to be discriminated against? And four, does that group have so, and we're going to hear more about this later, does that group have so much political power that it doesn't really need the courts, that it can get what it wants through the political process and that the courts don't really need to look at them with greater care. So three, as you recall, is whether someone should have to change. Um, early in our case, uh, the lawyers on the other side, who were the lawyers for what was called the Bipartisan Legal Advisory Group of the House of Representatives, who we renamed as BLAG, um, decided that they wanted information about Edie's first marriage. They actually asked us for her marriage certificate. Um, and after we got off the phone call with them when they made that request, I literally, this is not an exaggeration, I did the superior order dance from the church lady from Saturday Night Live in my office. <laughs> Why, you might ask? Because they wanted to show that Edie's marriage showed that she had a choice about being gay. But the truth of the matter is that Edie's marriage showed exactly the opposite. If Edie had had a choice about being gay, she'd still be married to Windsor. and She'd be living in Philadelphia, and she'd probably be you know, in a great house on the main line with a bunch of grandkids. But the fact of the matter is she didn't have a choice, and that's why back in the 50s, in a world that was very, very different than it is today, almost inconceivably different than it is today, she made the incredibly brave decision to tell her husband the truth and to move to New York City. So one more fact about Edie's life, and then we'll try to get in, into the meat of the Supreme Court. Um, she moves to New York. The biggest problem for her upon moving to New York, frankly, was not being gay. Because everyone who was gay back then, who was in middle class or above, was in the closet, totally in the closet. You couldn't live your life any other way. Uh, the bigger issue for Edie, frankly, at the time was being a woman. Because it had all, she had always assumed growing up that her husband would support her. And now she needed to find a job and figure out how to support herself. 
She had been good at math, apparently, in high school. She liked algebra. So she decided to enter into the mathematics graduate program at NYU. Uh, and she actually ultimately became one of the first computer programmers in the United States. While she was at NYU, she got a job working on a computer that was run at NYU that was used by the Atomic Energy Commission called the UNIVAC computer. If there are any computer geeks in this room, um, they probably know of it. It was the largest computer in the world at the time. It took up a whole city block at NYU, as I understand it. And she had a job writing code on that computer. Um, one day, at her apartment on the west side, she got a letter. And the letter was from the FBI. And the letter said, we'd like to talk to you about your Q, no pun intended, your Q security clearance <laughs> to work on this job on the UNIVAC computer. We don't think you need a lawyer yet, but we'd like to speak to you. Now, again, flashback in time. This was the 50s. This was the height of the McCarthy period. Um, at the time, uh, Edie was petrified. And her fears were completely justified, because at that time, it was a felony. It was a crime punishable by more than a year in prison for anyone who was, quote unquote, a homosexual to have any employment whatsoever with the federal government. So Edie gets this letter. She's petrified that they are on to her. Um, and she does some research on her own to try to figure out what she should do. And she's actually, I've checked it. She was actually a very good legal researcher. Uh, she concluded that under New York law at the time, uh, at least for a lesbian, as opposed to a gay man, there was a difference, but at least for a lesbian, what was illegal in New York was to appear or dress as a man. So Edie shows up at her FBI interview in high heels, a frilly dress, in crinolines, hoping, as she put it, to throw the FBI off their game. <laughs> Um, fortunately for Edie, and I would venture to say fortunately for the rest of the United States, uh, all the FBI cared about was whether her sister, had fr her sister had friends who were communists, who were in the teachers' union, this is for Debbie, and who were communists, and that's all they asked her about, and they never asked her whether she, she was a lesbian, and she got the security clearance. Um, again, an incredible fact. Remember when I was talking about those four factors, and the first one, is there a history of discrimination? Um, in our case, the other side, they, even they had to admit that there was a history of discrimination against gay people, obviously. But the argument they made was, yeah, but it wasn't so bad, and it didn't last very long, and it doesn't really happen anymore today, and no big deal. Um, and we were able to use this story that happened to Edie, uh, where she basically went into an interview knowing that if they asked the right question and she gave an honest answer, which she was determined to do, she would not only lose her job, but her career would be over, ruined. A man, talk about discrimination, and imagine what that life was like as opposed to the life that I've lived or the life that a lot of the young people in this room can live today. Okay, so that's all the stuff that happened in Edie's life before she even met Thea. Uh, the truly heroic part of her life is what happened after that, because they were together for 44 years. Uh, Ten years into their relationship, Thea was diagnosed with a really bad form of MS. Uh, over the course of her life, she uh, lost use of her legs and then her arms. By the time that she died, she was a quadriplegic. Um, and Edie and Thea have both said, and Edie said to me, that they made sure that not only did that diagnosis happen to both of them, but that they made sure that as little in Thea's life changed as possible. So actually, she was a psychologist in New York City, and on the day she died, she had two patients she was supposed to see that day who had to be called uh, and told what had happened. Um, uh, about two years before Thea died, she got a terrible diagnosis from her doctors that she didn't have long to live. Um, in the past, they had wanted uh, to get married, but they were waiting for it to happen in New York, their home state. Um, they couldn't, and that's my fault. Uh, I lost the marriage case in New York in 2006. I, I think I've kind of paid the, I mean, Edie back for that, but it is my fault. So the morning after getting that terrible diagnosis, Thea woke up and said to Edie, do you still want to get married? And he said, I do. And they decided that they were going to go to Toronto to get married, even though traveling to Toronto as a quadriplegic for Theo was an incredibly difficult thing to do. Uh, they had to go with four best women and two best men. They had to have people who could disassemble and reassemble the wheelchair. They got married at the Sheraton at the Toronto air airport so they could just kind of wheel Theo's wheelchair into the room. Uh, again, if you think about it, that's a couple who really, really, really wanted to get married. Um, Unfortunately, Thea died two years later. Edie was hit. Even though Edie had the best financial plan you know, my T&E partners have ever seen, um, she uh, was hit with this enormous tax bill, a state tax bill of $363,000, um, an estate tax bill that if she'd been married to a guy, if she'd been married to a guy that she'd met two weeks before, would have been zero. 
much less 40, 40 years before. Um, and that's how she got, we got the case. Lucky for me, she got my name and we, it took me about three seconds to decide to take the case. Uh, we won at the district court level. Uh, we won at the Second Circuit, which I could talk about, but I want to get to the, to the meat of this. Uh, and then we were on to the Supreme Court. So that's where I'm going to take you now. Um, and I'm going to try to take the excerpts from the argument kind of as they happen, with one exception. Um, so we're going to start uh, with the justice, otherwise known as Notorious RBG. Feel free to applaud. Um, I, obviously, I actually own one of these shirts. I would not put this up here, but for the fact that she fully approves of this and has endorsed the name. Otherwise, I obviously wouldn't do it. Uh, but you're going to hear right now why she, has, why she has the moniker Notorious RBG, and then I'll talk about it. Uh, as, as a prelude, uh, for the first couple passages, or even before I got up to speak, these, this is during the argument of my adversary, Paul Clement. Mr. Clement, the problem is that it would totally thwart the state's decision that there is a marriage between two people for the federal government, then some of say, no joint return, no marital deduction, no social security benefit. Your spouse is very sick, but you can't get leave. People, it, that set of attributes, one might well ask, what kind of marriage is this? Well, not, they're not a question of additional benefits. I mean, they touch every aspect of life. Uh, your partner is sick. Um, social security. I mean, it's, it's pervasive. It's not as though, well, there's this little federal sphere and it's only in a tax question. It's, it's as Justice Kennedy said, 1,100 statutes and it affects every area of life. And so you would re really diminishing what the state has said is marriage. You're saying, no, state, there are two kinds of marriages, the full marriage and then the sort of skin milk marriage. <laughs> so uh, what you just heard was actually a lot louder uh, than the way Justice Ginsburg sounded in the courtroom that day. Uh, she speaks pretty softly, and I really actually couldn't hear, even though we were sitting very close, I couldn't hear what she said. Um, and I turned to my co-counsel, Pam Carlin, and said, what did she just say? Because I heard people laughing. And when Pam said to me, she said, skim milk marriage, I, I literally, I'm not exaggerating, I kind of had to hold my arm down because I wanted to kind of do a Bronx cheer uh, <laughs> sitting at the council table. Um, why? I mean, one of the answers is we had spent so many hours in our case agonizing, really kind of going over and over and over again about how best to convey this to the court that by treating the marriages of straight people one way as valid and treating the marriages of gay people as another way as invalid, what DOMA did is create a kind of second-class citizenship, something that's completely uh, inconsistent with our Constitution. And we kept talking about how to put it, what words to use. Uh, well, leave it to no Notorious RBG, because right there on the bench, she's told me later that she just thought of this at the moment, and she clearly did. Uh, she managed to convey that idea of second-class citizenship better than anything, probably, that we put in our brief, this idea of a skim-milk marriage versus a full-milk marriage. Um, there's another part of this that I hope you picked up on that's very, very kind of typical of a case like this, um, particularly a high-profile case like this, and that is you probably heard Justice Ginsburg say, as Justice Kennedy said. Um, a lot of what happens in high-profile Supreme Court cases like this are the justices kind of on both sides trying to persuade Justice Kennedy. Um, and, and you hear Justice Ginsburg saying it quite explicitly there. You'll he, you, it probably happened several more times during the argument. Uh, we were, of course, very aware of the strategy uh, from day one. Uh, but we decided that it, I probably couldn't be so obvious during my argument to say, as Justice Kennedy said, that may look a little bit direct, even for a New Yorker. Uh, so what we did instead is we came up with a list. Uh, my colleague, Jaron Jargabani, came up with a list of the best Justice Kennedy passages from what at that time were his two prior major gay rights decisions, Romer v. Evans and Lawrence v. Texas. And we wrote them down on a piece of paper, and I literally walked through the streets of Washington, D.C. for two days, saying them over and over and over out loud. I'm sure people thought I was completely crazy because I wanted them to be on the tip of my tongue so I could use them during the argument without saying, as Justice Kennedy said. 
Uh, we had a bet on our team as to whether I would succeed in getting any of them out. Uh, I did once. I haven't collected on that bet yet, but it ended up being a dramatic part of the argument that you'll hear later. Okay, now we're going, uh, I, I can't help myself, I have to say this. Now we're going from one of the women justices from New York City to another one of the women justices from New York City, Justice Kagan. Um, I'm going to turn down the volume so it's not to hurt your ears. Um, and this also was still during the argument of my adversary, Paul Clement. Mr. Clement, for the these. most part, and historically, the only uniformity that the federal government has pursued is that it's uniformly recognized the marriages that are recognized by the state. So this was a real difference in the uniformity that the federal government was pursuing. And it suggests that maybe something, maybe Congress had something different in mind than uniformity. So we have a whole series of cases which suggest the following, which suggests that when Congress targets a group that is not everybody's favorite group in the world, that we look at those cases with some, even if they're not suspect, with some rigor to say, do we really think that Congress was doing this for uniformity reasons? Or do we think that Congress's judgment was infected by dislike, by fear, by animus, and so forth. I guess the question that this statute raises, this statute that does something that's really never been done before, is whether that sends up a pretty good red flag that that's what was going on. The other point I would make, but I also eventually want to get around to the animus point, but the other point I would make is, when you look at Congress doing something that is unusual, that deviates from the way they've They've, they've, they've done, proceeded in the past, you have to ask, well, was there a good reason? And in a sense, you have to understand that in 1996, something's happening that is, in a sense, forcing Congress to choose between its historic practice of deferring to the states and its historic practice of preferring uniformity. Up until 1996, it essentially has it both ways. Every state has the traditional definition. Congress knows that's the definition that's embedded in every federal law. It says, fine, we can defer. Okay, 1996. Well, is what happened in 1996, and I'm, I'm going to quote from the House report here, is that Congress decided to reflect and honor a collective moral judgment and to express moral disapproval of homosexuality. Is that what happened in 1996? Does the House report say that? Of course the House report says that. And if that's enough to invalidate the statute, then you should invalidate the statute. But that's never been your approach, especially under rational basis or even rational basis plus, if that's what you're suggesting. Okay, it's important to note here that I did not grow up as a Supreme Court practitioner. This was my first ever Supreme Court argument. Um, I did not clerk for Supreme Court justice. I did not work in the Solicitor General's office. Um, yeah, I grew up as a trial lawyer. Um, and because I grew up as a trial lawyer at Paul Weiss, I've been privileged to see many great cross-examinations um, in my career. Um, but I would say that of those many cross-examinations, this is probably at the top of the list. Um, I remember thinking as I was listening to this that I would personally rather be cross-examined by probably any other planet on the, on the universe as opposed to Justice Kagan. Um, it's an incredibly effective uh, uh, dialogue she has with Paul. Paul is the best. Uh, among the best, if not the best, Supreme Court advocate out there. He did a superb job of making these arguments seem kind of reasonable, which is incredible, frankly. Um, and even Paul, I think, was a bit shaken. I've never seen him as shaken as he was here, and even Paul, I think, was a bit shaken. Um, what was Justice Kagan getting at? Well, again, this was another one of the themes that as we kind of prepared the case and wrote our briefs, we were obsessed with. And this is the point that the other side wanted to make DOMA look like it was just some ordinary law. You know, it was as if Congress was just reappropriating money to the post office or the national park system. I'm not sure today that's so ordinary anymore, but uh, passed by huge majorities of Congress, signed by President Clinton, no big deal. Um, and it was very important for us to say that's not true. That's not what happened that there was a lot of evidence that what was going on in at least a lot of people's minds was either a fear of gay people, a dislike of gay people, a fear of the unknown, a variety of factors uh, that in constitutional terms, at least in gay constitutional terms, is known as animus. 
Um, but the problem is when you make this argument, and this is, doesn't matter whether it's a gay rights case, a women's rights case, or a civil right, African American rights case, you're always met with what I call the finger pointing argument. And it's very effective. And that argument is, okay, Ms. Kaplan, you're saying that some of the people who, who voted for DOMA maybe didn't have the best motives? Well, so you're saying everyone who voted for DOMA is a homophobe. Isn't that your argument? Um, and this is an argument we saw over and over again. Most of the briefs that were submitted on the other side said this over and over again. And it was something we were very conscious of. Uh, so we were trying to figure out how to do it, how to make the argument without getting this finger pointing. Um, so one of the things that we did is we kind of gave uh, in our brief a description of what had happened in Doma. We quoted some of kind of the most horrible things that people said when Doma was being passed. But we didn't follow, and you guys, don't tell, me, don't tell your professors I gave you permission to do this, but we didn't follow blue book format. Uh, we did not put the names of the people who said it in. Because we didn't want the court to think we were pointing fingers at them. We gave the quote, but we didn't put their names in. Um, and Justice Kagan here, when she's crossing, essentially cross-examining Paul Clement, is getting at that very issue, that it's not an ordinary statute, that something kind of extraordinary is going on. And she's referring to a statement that was in the House report that said that DOMA was being passed out of a moral disapproval of homosexuality. Um, one more point, and then I'll move on. Um, at the very end of this passage, you hear Paul say, does it say that in the House report? Yes, it says that in the House report. And if that's enough to invalidate the statute, you should invalidate the statute. Um, you know, I've read the Windsor opinion now hundreds of times, but I think a very cogent reading of the Windsor opinion is that's exactly what Justice Kennedy decided to do. So Justice Kagan was right on the pulse, I think, of where the court was going. Um, uh, one more point, because it, it'll get to some questioning later. So I was, part of the finger pointing issues, I was obsessed with President Clinton. And what I mean by that is I was very worried that I would get a question from the other side uh, that said, you know, Ms. Kaplan, President Clinton signed this into law. Are you saying that President Clinton was a homophobe? I was convinced I was going to get that question, and I wanted to deal with it. So about two months or so uh, before the briefs were submitted, I called a very good friend in New York who's very close to the Clintons, who worked for Senator Clinton, and I said, look, I want you to get in touch with the president. I want you to say this to him. And I, I honestly can't believe I had the chutzpah to do this. Um, I was using my best Jewish mother guilt strategy, but this is honestly what I said. I said, I want you to tell the president that, every day, that like everyone else, one day he's going to meet his maker. We all have to meet our maker, and he's going to meet his maker one day. And I know that signing Doma into law is not something that he's proud of. Um, but if he's ever going to express that thought, he's got to do it now. <laughs> because if he does it after the argument, it doesn't do me any good. Um, to his enormous credit, I mean, I, this is an example in the world we live in today that you can, me too, I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not immune from this. We can all become so cynical. We can all think that everything in D.C. is some inside political game, that everything's on Twitter and Facebook and Fox News and MSNBC. Uh, but this, I don't think, I think this is a kind of an antidote to that kind of cynicism because President Clinton, to his great credit, uh, two weeks before argument, published an op-ed in the Washington Post in which he said, yes, I signed into DOMA into law. Yes, it was wrong. Yes, it was based on a misunderstanding of who gay people are and what their relationships are like. And I believe today DOMA is unconstitutional. So that, you'll see, I avoided the is President Clinton a homophobe argument, but it definitely led to other questions that I did not anticipate that you're going to hear in a second. Um, so now we're going to get to the opening. Uh, you re we probably rewrote the opening. You know you get about 30 seconds or so to speak uninterrupted at the Supreme Court. Uh, 20 seconds or so. Uh, we rewrote this opening probably 7,000 times, um, and I'm just going to play it right now. Ms. Kaplan? Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court. I'd like to focus on why DOMA fails even under rationality review. Because of DOMA, many thousands of people who are legally married under the laws of nine sovereign states and the District of Columbia are being treated as unmarried by the federal government solely because they are gay. These couples are being treated as unmarried with respect to programs that affect family stability, such as the Family Leave Act, referred to by Justice Ginsburg. These couples are being treated as unmarried for purposes of federal conflict of interest rules, election laws, and anti-nepotism and judicial recusal statutes. And my client was treated as unmarried when her spouse passed away so that she had to pay $363,000 in estate taxes 
on the property that they had accumulated during their 44 years together. So despite those 7,000 redrafts, this actually isn't the opening I went into the Supreme Court room with that morning. Uh, the opening I went in with uh, had a different example in it. It talked about uh, DOMA and the military. Um, I talked about the fact that since uh, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, uh, the military was having this terrible problem, which is there were married, obviously married gay soldiers, and it had come to pass already that some of those soldiers had been killed or wounded uh, on duty. Um, and of course, it's a very big deal in military culture to properly honor people who've been uh, killed or wounded. And, but because of DOMA, the military couldn't do that. In other words, because of DOMA, the generals were prohibited from calling the spouse and telling the spouse that the soldier had died. They had to call the parent or someone else. And at the funerals, they were prohibited from giving the flag, after they fold up the flag, giving the flag to the spouse. They had to give it to someone else. And this was really agonizing the Pentagon brass. I was told this many times. Uh, they really thought it was an affront to the dignity uh, that is so important to their culture. Um, and that was kind of the central part of my opening. Uh, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, probably both, uh, the Solicitor General Don Verrilli got up before me. He had 15 minutes before me, and he used the example in his opening. So I remember thinking, oh my god, i got to put something else in very quickly. Uh, and this is what I ended up with. I think it worked out OK. Uh, but you know, you can't always control for everything in life. Um, now we're going to get to some of the fun stuff, because I'm a trial lawyer, so I like when you mix it up. Uh, so now we're going to get to some of the mixing it up. Uh, the first uh, passage is, I think, Justice Scalia, Chief Justice Roberts, and myself. There is uh, little doubt that the answer to the question of why Congress singled out gay people's marriages for disrespect through DOMA, the answer can't be uniformity, as we've discussed. It can't be cost savings, because you still have to explain then why the cost savings is being wrought at the expense of married couples who are gay. And it can't be any of the state interests uh, that weren't discussed, but uh, questions of family law and parenting and marriage are done by the states, not by the federal government. The only, the only conclusion that can be drawn is what was in the House report, uh, which is moral disapproval of gay people, which the Congress thought was permissible in 1996 because it relied on the court's Bowers decision, but this court has said was wrong not only uh, at the time it was dis uh, overruled in Lawrence, but was wrong when it was decided. So 84, sen uh, it's the same question I asked before, 84 senators uh, uh, based their vote on moral disapproval of gay people? No, I think, I think what's true, uh, Mr. Chief Justice, is that times can blind. And that uh, back in 1996, uh, people did not have the understanding that they have today that there was no distinction, there was no constitutionally permissible distinction. Well, does that mean times can blind? Does that mean they did not base their votes on moral disapproval? You no, know, some clearly did. I think it was based on an understanding that gay, that, uh, uh, incorrect understanding that gay couples were fundamentally different than straight couples, an understanding that I don't think exists today, and that's the sense I'm using that times can blind. I think there was uh, we all can understand that people have moved on this and now understand that there is no such distinction. So I'm not saying it was animus or bigotry. I think it was based on a misunderstanding of gay people in their uh, why, why, why are you so confident in that, in that judgment? How many, how many states uh, permit uh, gay, gay couples to marry? Today, nine, Your Honor. Nine. And, and, and so there's been this sea change between now and 1996. I think with respect to the understanding of gay people and their relationship, there has been a sea change around. So this is, uh, for people who've listened to this, and I think they're absolutely right, I say I'm doing quite a dance uh, during this part of the argument. Um, on the, this is all about finger pointing. I mean, on the one hand, I don't want to concede, because I don't think it's true, actually, that everyone who voted for DOMA was a bigot or a homophobe. On the other hand, some of the people kind of were. So the question here is how to kind of get that balance, and, and that's what I was doing, and that's what, this is where I won the bet, by the way, because this is, my answer to that was times can blind. Uh, times can blind, as, as many of you probably know, comes from Justice Kennedy's opinion in Lawrence, his 2003 opinion, um, and I think it really does explain what was going on, which is that people have just changed their views. There's a different understanding today of gay people than there were then. Um, when I use the phrase, though, I have to admit, all the justices knew what I was doing. Uh, <laughs> there's no doubt about that. You could see kind of their eyes pop a little bit when I said it. You probably heard Chief Justice Roberts actually use the phrase in his question to me. So uh, they all got what was going on there. 
Um, and we're going to go to the next passage, which is kind of a continuation on this, but there are two more points I want to make. Um, first of all, at the beginning of this, uh, for those of you who are really into the weeds here, uh, part of what I was doing, uh, quite frankly, is there was a case that was argued the day before, the, the Prop 8 case, Perry case. Um, and that case was seeking what the case this April, being argued at the end of April, is seeking, which is marriage rights in all 50 states. I was very worried, we on our team were very worried, that the court wasn't ready to go there yet. Uh, and so what I was doing was kind of pushing the Perry case away from the Windsor case and trying to make the justices understand that there was a distinction. Uh, we had a joke on our team that I could answer almost any question the justices asked by saying that the couples being impacted by DOMA, adversely impacted by DOMA, were already married and already gay. Uh, and there was nothing that the justices could do that would change either one of those facts. Uh, so I was doing a little bit of pushing the Perry the Perry case away because I wanted to make sure that they understand the differences. Well, one more thing is, uh, during the entire argument, and this is where the Supreme Court really is different than arguing in every other court, in any other court, I think I'm the only one who brought up any cases, who brought up any precedents. Um, there not, was not a single question from a justice about a prior case or a prior precedent or even about the kind of the details of the statute. Um, in retrospect, it's probably a pretty good thing that I'm the one who's citing the cases to the justices because obviously that suggests that the cases are good for us. Um, also something that happened at the argument, which I realized later, is not one of the justices, other than something you'll hear, kind of a softball you'll hear from Breyer, but not one of the justices and not one of the conservative justices asked me any questions about the rationales for DOMA. Not a single question about the arguments being made by the other side. Again, in retrospect, probably a pretty good sign. I suppose the seat change has a lot to do with the political force and effectiveness of people representing, uh, supporting your side of the case. I disagree with that, uh, Mr. Chief Justice. I think the seat change has to do, just as was discussed in Bowers and Lawrence, with an understanding that there is no difference, there is no fundamental difference that could justify this kind of quote, categorical, this categorical discrimination between gay couples. You don't doubt that the lobby supporting the enactment of same-sex marriage laws in different states is politically powerful, do you? Um, with respect to that category, that categorization of the term uh, for purposes of heightened scrutiny, I would, Your Honor. I don't. Really? Yes. As far as I can tell, political figures are falling over themselves to endorse your side of the, of the case. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Chief Justice, is that no other group in recent history has been subjected to popular referenda to take away rights that have already been given or exclude those rights the way gay people have. And only two of those referenda have ever lost. One was in Arizona, it then passed a couple of years later. One was in Minnesota, where they already have a statute on the books that prohibits marriages between gay people. So I don't think, and until 1990, Gay people were not allowed to enter this country. So I don't think that the political power of gay people today could possibly be seen within that framework uh, and certainly is analogous. I think gay people are far weaker than women were at the time of Frontier. Well, but you just referred to a sea change in people's understandings and values from 1996 when DOMA was enacted. And I'm just trying to see where that comes from, if not from the political effectiveness of uh, uh, groups on your side of the case. To flip the language of the House report, Mr. Chief Justice, I think it comes from a moral understanding today that gay people are no different and that gay married couples' relationships are not significantly different than the relationships of straight married couples. Uh, so a couple things. First of all, this is the result of the Clinton op-ed, obviously. Um, there's no way that the justices weren't, didn't have that at least partially in mind when they asked me these questions. Um, when the Chief Justice said to me, my parents uh, from Cleveland were sitting in the courtroom that day, uh, and when the Chief Justice said to me, really? Uh, and I said, yes. My mom told me she was seized with panic uh, that a bunch of marshals were going to come over and kind of handcuff me and lead me away. <laughs> um, uh, we did, uh, God, countless moots, seven formal and, and probably 20 or so informal, more than that, informal moots to prepare for this argument. I, I did, I worked on this pretty much full time uh, from the time the court granted cert. And we literally would go to bars, we'd go to the gym, we'd have dinner, and we would just practice the questions over and over and over and over again. So that there really wasn't, frankly, any question that the justice asked me that we hadn't practiced many, many, many times. Um, and we kind of had a sense of what answers we would give to what questions, and we talked about it, again, kind of over and over and over again. Uh, this one answer that I gave at the end, where I said, I'm going to flip the language in the House report. I want to flip from the moral disapproval in the House report to a moral understanding today. 
uh, is an answer that literally popped into my head at that moment. Um, and I remember when you're doing something like this, you're kind of thinking at kind of warp speed. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, um, I think this is right. I haven't vetted this. I can't turn around and ask Pam Carlin if she thinks it's a good answer or not. Uh, but I'm just going to go for it. Um, and I honestly think, I mean, uh, it's a little schmaltzy on my part, but I, I honestly think that something, God, a higher power, you can call it whatever you want, put that idea into my head. Because it was obviously such a good answer, um, and we never practiced it before. It literally kind of came in a flesh. Um, I'm going to do one more thing, which is Justice Breyer, this is the softball I was referring to earlier, asking the same question of me and Paul. Um, it was a question about really the only rationale that was really being uh, argued by the other side at this point, the argument that DOMA was okay uh, because it promoted uniformity, because it allowed the federal government to treat gay marriages all one way. Uh, the problem with that argument, the obvious problem with that argument, is that DOMA, uh, marriages have been different in the states for our country's entire history. In New York, for example, first cousins can get married. Um, I don't know the law in Indiana, but I doubt they can. Um, and the federal government has always deferred to those differences. It's never been a big deal. Um, so DOMA wasn't treating marriages uniformly. The only thing that DOMA was treating uniformly was gay people. And that's not uniformity, that's discrimination. So you're going to hear my answer to the question. All right, so you're saying uniform treatment's good enough no matter how odd it is, no matter how irrational. There's nothing but uniformity. We could take the... Uh, no matter, you see what I'm, where I'm going? I, I, no, I see exactly where you're going, Justice right. Breyer. And, 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 well, again, if we're, if, if we're coming at this from the premise that the states have the option to choose, and then we come at this from the perspective that the Congress is passing this, not in the vacuum, they're passing this in 1996. And what they're confronting in 1996 is the prospect that one state, through its judiciary, will adopt same-sex marriage, and then by operation of the full faith and credit law, that will apply to any, any couple that wants to go there. And the state that's thinking about doing this is why it's a very nice place to go and get married. And so Congress is worried that people are going to go there, go back to their home jurisdictions, insist on the recognition in their home jurisdictions of their same-sex marriage in Hawaii, and then the federal government will borrow that de definition. And therefore, by the operation of one state's state judiciary, same-sex marriage is basically going to be recognized throughout the country. And what Congress says is, wait a minute, let's take a time out here. This is a redefinition of an age-old institution. Let's take a more cautious approach where every sovereign gets to do this for themselves. What, what do you think of this? The argument that I heard was, to put the other side, at least one part of it, as I understand it, said, look, the federal government needs a uniform rule. There has been this uniform <laughs> one man, one woman rule for several hundred years or whatever, and there's a revolution going on in the states. We either adopt the resolution, the revolution, or push it along a little, or we stay out of it. And I think Mr. Clement was saying, well, we've decided to stay out of it. Uh, and the way to stay out of it is to go with the traditional thing. I mean, now that's, that's an argument. So your answer to that argument is what? I think it's an incorrect argument, Justice Breyer, for this reason. I understand you do. Cong I'd like to know the reason. <laughs> of course. Congress did not stay out of it. Section 3 of DOMA is not staying out of it. Uh, Section 3 of DOMA is stopping the recognition by the federal government of couples who are already married solely based on their sexual orientation. And what it's doing is undermining, as you can see in the briefs of the states of New York and others, it's undermining the policy decisions made by those states that have permitted gay couples to marry. <clears throat> states that have already resolved the cultural, the political, the moral, whatever other controversies they're resolved in those states. And by fencing those couples up, couples who are already married, and treating them as unmarried for purposes of federal law, you're not, you're not taking it one step at a time, you're not promoting caution, you're putting a stop button on it, and you're having discrimination for the first time in our country's history against a class of married couples. Okay, let me, uh, I want to get questions from you guys, and don't be shy. If I could take questions from these guys, I can, I can probably handle them from you. Um, so let me just take it up to date really quickly. Uh, that's the way the country looked when we filed our case. Uh, as you'll see, New York is not pink. Again, my fault, my bad. Um, this is the way the country looks today. Um, as you guys, oh, let me go. Uh, part of the reason for that is Justice Scalia's dissent. Um, he did a very uh, clever 
exercise in his dissent where he kind of did a black lining of Justice Kennedy's opinion and showed how the language and the logic of it would lead to marriage in all 50 states, and he was absolutely right about that. Um, these are the decisions to date uh, relying on Windsor to hold uh, that gay people have equal rights under the law. Um, as you all know, there's a case uh, before the Supreme Court, you heard Steve mention it now, it's going to be argued on April 28th. Um, uh, I believe I'm very, well, I don't want to jinx things, but I, I'm pretty co comfortable that the court will reach the same result as it did in Windsor um, and that we will have marriage equality in, in all 50 states. So please ask me some questions. Sure, back there. I'm curious, uh, how do you think it'll work out? Five, four, six, three, uh, will, will Roberts try to unify the court or will it be a Kennedy decision? Uh, a couple things. First of all, anyone who tries to tell you that they can kind of predict how the judge is gonna vote, I, I'd like to know where they went to law school because <laughs> I'm not aware of any law school that teaches that. Um, you know, I think for sure we'll get the same votes on our side as we got last time, which includes Justice Kennedy. Um, Assuming that's true, I, I believe that out of deference to just Ke Justice Kennedy's real dominance in this area, uh, the court may let him write the opinion. He's really the only justice who's written th all three major opinions in one area. That's kind of unique. Um, so my guess is that he'll be able to write this one as well. Uh, whether or not there's another justice that joins, I, I sure hope so, uh, but I don't know the answer to that. Um, referring to Justice Scalia's dissent, um, do you personally find any validity in his statement that, you know, that they weren't giving either side, that they shouldn't be ruling in this case, or that they weren't giving the sides an honest victory? What would you, did you find any validity in his dissent, or what did you think about that? Well, the short answer to that question is no. Uh, the long answer to that question is, look, he does say something in the dissent where he's making a valid point, which is the, the Supreme Court jurisprudence on equal protection and the level of scrutiny that applies to laws that treat gay people differently is, shall we say, unclear. Um, and uh, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, the Windsor opinion did very little uh, to cast any light on that lack of clarity. Um, and Justice Scalia is right about that. It's, it's not a decision that kind of clarifies doctrine the way a lot of people were hoping for um, and are still hoping for this time. Um, I also think he was 100% right about that, that Windsor is going to lead to marriage equality. And the reason I think he's right about that is, as I said, uh, uh, like I've mentioned before, that Windsor, in Windsor, uh, Kennedy uses the phrase dignity, the word dignity, to describe gay people, I think it's 10 times in 23 pages. Um, and each time he says that, what he's really saying is that gay people have the same dignity as everyone else. Well, once you say that, once the Supreme Court has said that, then it's pretty hard to come up with any decent argument for why gay people should be treated differently under the law. So I do think that Justice Scalia was absolutely right that the logic and language of Windsor are gonna have led to where we are today. And I also agree with him that Chicago-style pizza is not really pizza, by the way. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Given your just answer you just gave. Can you comment on the religious, so-called religious freedom act that Judge Arthur has just signed into law? Yeah, I, I, look, it's a, it's very much a new thing. I mean, he's, I don't think he signed it yet, but I guess he's going to sign it today. Has he signed it? Because he just signed it. Um, uh, there's no question that these laws are being, are kind of the new argument uh, being used by the other side because all the other arguments have failed. Um, uh, the question, the, so the, this issue came up most recently in the Hobby Lobby case, and that was about whether a corporation could not offer certain kinds of birth control uh, to its employees on grounds that it, it offended the owner's religious beliefs. Um, and the court said that was basically okay. Um, this is going to present a different question. And the question here will be, is it okay for someone, and I'm trying to think of hypotheticals, but is it okay for a store owner in Indiana uh, to tell a woman, let's start with a woman, to tell a say, say it's a very religious Muslim person who believes women should not be out on the streets, and is it okay for that person to basically kick a woman out of their store because it offends his religious beliefs that women live life this way? I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here, but I'm pretty comfortable that the courts will say that's not okay, even under this law. Um, and if that's right, then the next question is, well, can a store owner say to two les married lesbians who come with their kid to buy clothes, that they have to leave the store, they can't buy clothes in the store. And again, I think ultimately, the courts will say that's not okay either. Um, 
the really unfortunate thing about this bill, though, is it's going to be very painful to get there. Um, and it's going to happen a lot of times, and a lot of people are going to be hurt, uh, and a lot of children are going to be hurt, and that's not okay at all. Um, so that's the best I can offer um, without, again, being able to see into the minds of the Supreme Court justices. Uh, that's the best I can offer. It's definitely not good news, uh, but I think that these statutes, as applied that way to gay people, I don't think the courts are going to permit that. I mean, uh, one other way of looking at it is in Hobby Lobby, the, 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 really the test is whether uh, the, the statute at issue is using the least restrictive means of kind of not offending someone's religion, be, religious beliefs. And they said in Hobby Lobby it wasn't because there were other things they could do to get contraception to these employees. But here, I've been thinking about this this morning, it seems to me that the least restrictive means, probably the only restrictive means of prohibiting discrimination, to quote Chief Justice Roberts, is to prohibit discrimination. I don't know any other way to do it. So again, under that kind of a test, I think ultimately the courts, the courts will rule our way. I hope. We, we actually, we need microphones for purposes of live streaming. So. Roberta, I don't have a question. I just want to thank you so much for being here. We are honored by your presence, and, and we're grateful for the work you've done. Oh, that's a much easier question than some of the questions I got at the court, so thank you very much. <laughs>